So one of the yeah. biggest things I do that I've found that personally helps me mm-hmm. is the last thing I do at night. It's a it's a night ritual that affects my next day. The last thing I do at night is I take a post-it. I write down the three things that I will get done today, the next day. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So now when I wake up in the morning, I don't even have to think about it. These are the three top priorities for today. And I do not go to bed until those three things are completed. Welcome back, everyone, to the Passive Road to Retirement. I'm your host, Andrew Jarrett. Today, we're joined by Neil Shep. Neil spent 40 plus years in New York City where he grew up and hit every kid's exacta. He first became a police officer and then a fireman. Through his 24 years of working the streets of New York City, he came face to face with fear and found numerous ways of harnessing its power and using that power to take action instead of becoming frozen by it. Now, Neil is on a conquest to help people use the energy created by fear to push through the fear and achieve the life they deserve. In his free time, Neil enjoys spending time outdoors, mountain biking, fishing, and hiking with his wife and two children. Neil, welcome to the show. Hey, Andrew. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Great to have you on. So, policeman, fireman, and now multifamily investor. Maybe you can kind of describe that life cycle there for us and how you you transition. Holy cow, right? Like every kid's dream is to be a, a policeman and a fireman. And I ended right. up doing Dude, both. <laughs> I, I ended up doing both of them. So that career was absolutely awesome. And it, it taught me a lot. But at the end of the day, I was still in that W2 rat race cycle. Yeah. And I just, I wanted more. I wanted to kind of live my life by my design as opposed to living uh, life by life's design. Sure. So I ended up leaving the fire department, leaving the city employment after 24 years. And I went into business. I opened a preschool and oh. I went into multifamily investing. So I, I have a couple of properties and that passive income. I created a product with a, a partner. I created partnerships. So I started delving into multiple streams of income mm-hmm. so that I could kind of live life by my rules, not by someone else's. Yep. They say seven streams of income, right? That's what the shoes are. So preschool, how'd you, how'd that evolve? So the wife says, the wife, I was a New York City police officer and fireman. The wife was a New York City teacher. So she went out and she's getting her doctorate right now. She'll have a doctorate in December in education. And through her background, she really focuses on early childhood education. So she knows how those little minds work. They little kids completely confuse me. (laughs) It's her her wheelhouse and she does a great job at it. So that's cool. Just out of curiosity, which one did you like better? The policeman or firefighter? Fireman. Fireman. Yeah. 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 Hands down. Uh, Everybody's happy to see a fireman. Nobody was happy to see me when I was a police officer, right? Like it's the sad truth of the profession. True. You show up as a as a cop, it's never a good situation. Yeah, yep. So now you're um, deep in deep in the mindset. It looks like I love. By the way, I would love the wall. You know, I was mentioning to you behind you. That's incredible. I like. That. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, it's a couple of key phrases that always resonated with me. Mm-hmm. And when I look at it, it helps me focus. Right, like if I'm hitting a roadblock, I come in here and I can put that roadblock in one of these buckets. Yep. And then it's just like, all right, it, it grounds me. It brings me back to the beginning and the basics. Hmm. Now, what I guess once you changed your mindset, you know, shifted that, what changed for you uh, personally or business wise, you know, once you shifted into that different? Everything. So, New York City, let, let's frame this for a second. I grew up in New York City back in the 70s and the 80s. My father literally, and when you're a kid, your father's your biggest influence, right? Mm -hmm. My father literally said to me uh, two things that really affected me. Everybody is out for something. Everybody has their angle. They're always looking to scam you. That was the first thing he said. And when I went to the police department, I saw that firsthand. Yeah. Right. Because (laughs) every time somebody calls a police officer, something bad happens to them. Right. And I was seeing all I was seeing scams getting pulled. I was seeing people getting ripped off. 
I was seeing the worst of the worst in society. Mm -hmm. So everything that my father said, oh, yeah, this, this must be true. So I became very guarded. Yeah. I didn't want to form partnerships. I didn't trust other individuals. And what happened was I seeked out multifamily real estate and my mentor in multifamily real estate gave me the education in multifamily. But what he gave me even more of was the mindset. And mm -hmm. once my mindset started slowly changing, once I started looking at people in a through a different lens and opportunities as actual opportunities, not as someone's taking advantage of me. Right. Once once I was able to look through that lens, that was it. It was off the races. Hmm. Everything, everything changed from there. Interesting there. I kind of picked up, you said, you know, when when you were a police officer, you had almost like a scarcity mindset, right? You didn't want to be uh partners with anybody, but now you look at it like abundance. Like I want to probably want to partner with whoever you can. And, you know, it's multifamily is a team sport. So I'm sure it's probably, it's, you know, changed for you a bit. It's a complete 180. I, I went from everybody's out to get you to, all right, what do you need? I, I'll give you whatever I can. Yeah. Because proximity, right? right? I put myself in that multifamily room and being in that multifamily room that group of individuals was very genuine mm -hmm. and very forthcoming. Yep. So if you need something, you just ask them. And if they have the ability to help you, they will help you. No questions asked. Mm -hmm. And being around that and seeing that slowly chipped away at that wall. Sure. Yeah. I'm, I'm I mean, I'm excited you're on here because I mindset to me is huge. So I have, some, I have some questions for you. So I read a book, uh, Trevor Moet. I'm not sure if you read it. He worked with Russell Wilson uh, from the NFL. I think it was called It Takes What It Takes. And his, mm -hmm. his view was basically your thoughts, your negative thoughts, if you think negatively, are like four to seven times more likely to happen. And if you speak them out loud, it's like it was like 10 or 15x, you know, more likely to occur. I'm just curious, you know, what your take on and that is and what you think about you know thought patterns in general so i don't know those numbers specifically but they sound accurate to me yeah i would believe those numbers right mm -hmm. and i read a study by the national science foundation that said we have roughly fifty thousand thoughts a day yep now, obviously if we thought about it like we'd only be able to write down a couple of dozen thoughts that we acknowledge we have right right mm -hmm. we're having fifty thousand thoughts a day 80% of those thoughts are negative. Right. 95% are repetitive. That's so 95% of your thoughts are repetitive day after day after day. Mm -hmm. So you can see how you can go down that downward spiral very quickly oh, yeah. if 80% of your thoughts are negative. Right. Right. So that's that's like real life stuff. So what I try and do is. I try and think on the positive side of things, not disillusional, right? but looking at the positive, because if I'm concentrating more on the positive, if I'm aware of what I'm thinking about, what my thought cycle is, and even in, that I'm aware of a thought cycle, mm -hmm. right? When I become aware that I have a thought cycle, I can interrupt that thought cycle, right. and then I can go off and change those thoughts very mm -hmm. actively, very intentionally, very strategically. Yep. Uh, I use a system called AIR. I designed a system called AIR, right? Awareness, mm -hmm. interrupt, and replace. Mm -hmm. So become aware of your thoughts. After you become aware of your thoughts, interrupt that thought. Is this thought serving me? Right. And then determine whether that thought's serving you or not. And if it's not serving you, then replace that thought. How do I replace that thought? The easiest way is just making it a positive. So I'm not smart enough. I am smart enough. That's the real beginner level 101 way of doing it. Mm -hmm. And then as you start training your mind to think in a certain way, it now becomes more and more automatic that your mind operates this way. And now, as you become more aware of your thoughts, you're noticing that I'm becoming aware of my thoughts, but my thoughts are now more in the positive realm 
than in the negative realm. Right. Yeah, because out of those 50,000, I mean, majority are probably subconscious, right? Where you're not even yes. picking up. How long do you think it takes to actually break that cycle? You know, when you actually start interrupting your thoughts, you know, what, what do you think the time frame is, I guess, to, to start getting out of that? So in the beginning, what's going to happen is your, your listeners are going to hear this, right? And they're going to be like, that's a great idea. I'm going to implement it. Right. And then five minutes from now, they're going to realize that they, they had a thought and they didn't implement it. And then they're going to beat themselves up over it. It's part of the process. Don't beat yourself up. Give yourself, right. show yourself a ton of grace, yeah. especially in the beginning. How long does it actually physically take? Uh, for some, For some thoughts... It'll take you a week or two weeks. Other thoughts, it'll take you a month, depending on how deeply rooted they are. Mm -hmm. Don't focus on the amount of time it takes. Focus on the process. Sure. So if I'm a person that is aware of my thoughts, then over the course of time, as I do things more and more, I will become aware quicker and quicker, and I will then replace quicker and quicker and two, you're building the habit of it just automatically happens. Yeah. Yep. As opposed to you are actually aware of taking the action. So don't really concentrate on the time because mm -hmm. for every thought and for every person, there's going to be a different timeline. Sure. Concentrate on the process. Yep. And this is extremely important. That person that had that thought and then realizes they had that thought an hour later. Mm -hmm. Way to go. Yep. <laughs> I'm going to give you a big high five because that's the first step, right? The first step's awareness. Right. Yep. So you became aware of it. It's mm -hmm. not going to happen overnight. Yep. Now, once you break, I guess, that habit of the negative thinking, I mean, I'm, I'm huge on habits, right? Your habits become, you know, your lifestyle, which is, you know, determines your life. I guess, do you have any, you know, daily habits that once you change your mindset kind of help you get, become successful, you know, or any, any habits you think people should try to follow? So in following habits, uh, I listened, uh, I listened to a podcast once. This guy was super smart. I don't remember his name, but he said, when people offer you what they've done, don't say, oh, well, that's exactly what I have to do, right? Like I have to get up. The, the big thing is I got to get up at five o'clock in the morning, right? Mm -hmm. Successful people get up at five o'clock in the morning. I know plenty of success, successful people that get up at seven, eight o'clock in the morning. Right. Yeah. Right. Like, so I think in building your habits, you build what works for you. Mm -hmm. So listen to everybody else's habits, listen to what they're doing see what resonates for you, and then run with that. Getting up at five o'clock in the morning doesn't resonate with me. <laughs> right. It just doesn't. Like, yeah. I'm never, <laughs> I, like, I'm not that guy. Yeah, but at least you My, acknowledge that and you know that, right? You know, that's half Right. Yeah. So I'll, I'll do, like, a morning ritual. Right. My morning ritual starts about seven o'clock in the morning, though. Mm -hmm. Right? And I don't do the same things every day. I have a group of things and I'll do two or three of them hmm. depending on how I feel in the morning oh, because okay. that's just to get me in alignment to shove off for the rest of the day. So one of the okay. biggest things I do that I've found that personally helps me mm -hmm. is the last thing I do at night. It's a, it's a night ritual that affects my next day. The last thing I do at night is I take a post-it. I write down the three things that I will get done today. The next day. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So now when I wake up in the morning, I don't even have to think about it. These are the three top priorities for today. Yep. And I do not go to bed until those three things are completed. Hmm. So sometimes that means I'm up to two o'clock in the morning because there were a lot of fires I had to put out during the day. Right. And I, I get home and all of a sudden it's 10 o'clock and I'm like, oh, man, I didn't. I got to do this. Mm hmm. It's on the list. I got to do it. It's one of the top three. So with that being said, I try and do those three. The first block in the morning when sure. the fires aren't as big. That makes sense. And it's really the discipline too, to make sure you do that every day, right? Like I said, you could be up yes. to two in the morning. Just, 
you know, you probably don't feel like doing it, but you miss, you make sure it's done. You, yes, you have to have that discipline. Um, discipline equals freedom, right? Oh yeah. There you go. It's, it's one of the benchmarks. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to have that discipline of, and to me, discipline is just doing what I say I'm going to do. Sure. Right. So discipline can be different to everybody, but for me, that's what it is. It's the integrity of, of getting those things completed that I said I was going to complete. Mm -hmm. Now I noticed on your website, you have the, uh, the seven levels of self perception. I thought it yes. was extremely interesting. Uh, maybe you could just go through a few of them or, you know, kind of give us an overview of that. I thought it was really helpful. Uh, absolutely. Uh, so the seven levels of perception are not mine. They're from Bruce Schneider. He wrote a book called energy leadership. That was the first introduction I had from my mentor to mindset. Hmm. Bruce Schneider founded a uh, IPEC coaching. So he okay. trains individuals to be coaches hmm. and he coaches individuals. Oh, okay. Uh, so he came up with the seven levels and those seven levels really resonated with me. I was sitting down with my mentor and he said to me, he said, if I ask you like, Why'd you put your phone there on the table? And how would you take that? Well, you could take it as Neil can take it as you put your, I'm, I'm saying to you, the phone's on the table and it's rude because we're having a conversation. Right. Like you and I are having a conversation. Why is your phone out? Mm -hmm. That's how I could have taken that comment. And he could have meant it as, well, it's on the table and the glass of water could spill over and wreck your phone. Ah, uh, true. Mm -hmm. So life really is about perceptions. Hmm. So the, the seven levels, I really concentrate on the first four levels because that's where most of us operate. Okay. And those first four levels of victim, conflict, responsibility, and concern. Hmm. I'll run you through a, a real quick scenario. I want you to envision that you drove to Walmart and you parked in the parking lot and you went into Walmart and now you came out of Walmart. And now you're sitting in your car. You're about to leave. Right. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, somebody backs into you. Bang. Right. How do you react to that? Do you re first off, do you react to it or do you respond to it? So you could have the reaction of the victim mindset. Everything always happens to me. If I didn't have bad luck, I'd have no luck. Right. This happened this morning. I woke up and my uh, I couldn't find my shoes. And and then this happened and it's raining out. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep. Or you could have what I used to, what used to be my reaction was the reaction to conflict. You mm -hmm. could jump out of that car and teach him a lesson. Right. <laughs> you Where'd you get your license out of a jack? Cracker Jack box? <laughs> what the hell are you doing? You didn't see me park there? Right. Right? <laughs> yeah. That's out of conflict. Mm -hmm. You can get out of the car and walk over and say, I'm really sorry. Is everything okay? Like, take responsibility. Sure. You didn't do anything to cause the accident per se, mm -hmm. but you did choose to go to Walmart at that point in time. You did choose that parking spot out of the 200 parking spots that were available. True. Right? Yep. So you can take responsibility for that small role that you're playing. And when you take responsibility, it really does deflate the situation. Yeah. You, you, you actually feel more in control, hmm. more like you have the freedom of life. Or you can jump out of your car and you can act in, the, in concern, right? The next level, the fourth level, concern. You can go over to the person and be like, is everything okay? Are you all right? Do you need medical help? Sure. Did you get hurt? Mm -hmm. Right? Because at the end of the day, what's going to be the result of all of this at the end of the day? It's all you're the same. Gonna, right? You're going to exchange insurance information mm -hmm. and your car is going to get fixed. Yeah, you're going to have the inconvenience of not having your car, the inconvenience of dealing with the insurance company and the, the body shop and everything. But at the end of the day, that's why we have insurance. Yeah. So you get to choose, you have the power of choice in how that incident goes mm -hmm. by your level of perception. Yep. So basically your, your response 
or reaction, I guess. Yes. It's kind of what creates the outcome, right? So there's reaction and there's response. Mm -hmm. Reaction is victim in conflict. Yeah. Right. You just, it's that innate caveman trigger. Mm -hmm. And you're just going to, to town. Yep. Where in the response, that's when you count to three, right? You take a couple of deep breaths. And now, all of a sudden, that slows things down. Mm-hmm. And now you can respond in a more rational manner. Sure. Yep. Right? You could think about, all right, how, if I was the individual that that caused this, how would I want to be treated? Right? Mm-hmm. Do you want to as you wish to do unto yourself? Right. So taking those deep breaths and, and counting actually works because it interrupts. Mm-hmm. It interrupts that automatic reaction that you have, and you move to response. Yep, that makes a lot of sense. I'm sure that helps both personal life and business. You know how you respond to things, uh, especially in business. You know something bad yes. happens to calm down right. before you know have an emotional response. So they always tell you, like you 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 write out that email, right? But don't right. send it. Yep. Right. <laughs> so it's the same thing. I don't even write out the email. I'll write it on a piece of paper. Because yeah. I'm afraid I'll end up sending it by, <laughs> by accident, right? By accident, yeah. right? Like habit, right? Like, yeah, I, I type an email, I send it, right? It, yeah, it's so automated in doing that. that right, <laughs> you can't undo those, unfortunately. So, absolutely. So, so write it on a pad of paper. Yeah, <laughs> that's good advice. Well, now, uh, one thing I saw on your website actually, too, was you were talking about mainstream media, and I loved it because oh. I personally try not to watch. You know, as many as much news as I can get away from, I try to steer away. So, yep. I just maybe like to hear you know your thoughts on that as well. Um, I think it's can be depressing and just create anxiety, especially lately. I mean, so I like to hear your take. So, absolutely, I'm going to challenge all of your viewers to go on a diet, mm-hmm. and it's a news diet. Don't watch the news for 30 days. If yep. you think that's too long, dumb it down to 15. Mm-hmm. Or seven or three, right? Right. So going back to my mentor and my introduction to mindset, that's exactly what he did with me. He challenged me to a 30-day news diet. Yeah. And what that did, because I didn't realize it, I'm just watching the news. But the news is constantly negative. The news is a business. Their job is revenue. How they get revenue is viewership. How they get viewership is awe. Yep. They just got to shock and awe you. Mm-hmm. Right? Yeah. So it doesn't It doesn't matter. Politics is great for this, right? It doesn't matter what aisle, what side of the aisle you land on, mm-hmm. right? One side will fire you up, and the other side is the complete enemy. Yep. And it gets you all charged up, and the world's coming to an end, right? Yep. I'll give you a, a few examples. The world didn't come to an end after the Great Depression, mm-hmm. right? Yep. The world didn't come to an end after the world wars. Mm-hmm. Re- more recently, the world didn't come to an end after 9-11. Right. Right? I was physically there on 9-11. Oh, in really? New really? York, wow. In New York City, standing under... I was a quarter of a mile from the towers when, when the incident happened. Wow. The world, the world didn't come to an end, though. Mm-hmm. Right. We had the housing crash in 08. The world didn't come to an end. Yeah. We had wildfires out in the in the West. The world didn't come to an end. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. Even with the most recent COVID, right? It's still a, a topic right now. But the world didn't come to an end. Mm-hmm. But if you watch the news, all of this bad stuff is happening. Yep. The world's coming to an end. And it's just, it's not how it is. So I literally do not watch the news. I can't tell you, I cannot tell you three current events right now. And people look at me like, like I'm strange because there's a part of it of you really should kind of have an outline, an idea of what's going on. Mm -hmm. I let my network take care of that. Yeah. So if there is anything that's really, really critical. You'll know. <laughs> then my network, yeah, then my network yeah. will, will let me know about it. Yeah. But I, I don't watch it because you just go down the you go down the rabbit hole. 
what do they say? If you watch the news, if you don't watch the news, you're uninformed. If you watch the news, you're misinformed, right? Yes. <laughs> yes. Because like, face it, whether it's Fox News or CNN, yeah. right? Just me saying Fox News and CNN makes some people's skin curl. Blood boil. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right? Yep. And exactly. whether they're right or they're wrong, they're just hurling grenades at the other side. And it's there's nothing in the middle. Mm -hmm. So I don't really pay attention to it. Right. Yeah. It's just to me, it's all smoke and mirrors, and they're just pulling levers to create their readership. Even worse on social media with the algorithms, you know, algorithms yes. how they tailor it to you directly. So if you get yes. if you're going to Facebook or you know, whatever for your for your news, that's even worse. <laughs> but you know, just how that's something that's out of my control, right? Right. So I can't worry. I'm not going to waste brain cells on it. Mm -hmm. I'm going in this direction. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm concentrating on. Whatever happens over there, happens over there. Yep. I will pivot to what happens over there, but it doesn't matter to me. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care who the president is. They're like, oh, right. uh, we need Republicans in office because they will create business. And the Democrats just want to give money away. and. Listen, they all want to give money away. Right. They all have their own agenda. Yep. Just tell me what the rules are, and I'll figure out how to play by your rules. I'll play mm -hmm. the game by your rules. Just tell me what the rules are. And a lot yep. of times they don't tell you what the rules are. They, they leave it up to interpretation. That's why you surround yourself with proximity, and you yep. surround yourself with people that are smarter than you. Yep, exactly. Now, starting out, I mean, overall, the life of an entrepreneur and an investor is kind of up and down. Good days, bad days, right? Yes, scary. absolutely. Uh, do you have any advice for, you know, even seasoned investors or somebody just starting out that, you know, how to get rid of their limiting beliefs and, and uh, you know, maybe that negative self-talk they might have about thinking they can't, you know, can't get a deal, never find a deal, never raise this capital, you know, something like that. So you are where you are in life because that's where you're supposed to be at this moment. So mm -hmm. if you're in that I can't find a deal, right? I can't find a deal. I can't find a deal. I can't find a deal. Well, Albert Einstein says that you can't solve the problem with the same thinking that created the problem. Mm -hmm. To do something different. Yes. So what do you do? You can't find the deal. What are the things that you are actually doing? And don't tell me, I get this a lot. Like when I talk to somebody, they'll be like, well, I did direct mail. Okay, well, how many times did you send direct mail out? How often are you sending it out? Right. How many times are you following up? Mm -hmm. So if you're going to do direct mail and you're telling me direct mail doesn't, doesn't work, then I'm going to automatically make that assumption. I'm going to ask you, but right. more times than not, they've only done it once or twice. Right. Direct mail is a long, Mark is a game. long time play. Mm -hmm. so it's, you have to commit when you when you say I'm going to do direct mail. You have to commit to six months of that at a minimum. Yeah, I mean it can take years for direct mail yes. to do a deal. You know, I I know a, another one of my partners uh, invests down in Arkansas, and he actually built relationships with individuals down there, and he just closed on one. I want to say it was four years, four or six years really? that he was going back and forth and just. Following up, how are you? I'm going to be in Arkansas. You want to go out to lunch? And, and just keeping that relationship alive. Mm -hmm. And that's what it takes. Yeah, A lot of people don't want to do that. A lot of people don't want to make that cold call and follow up with individuals. Yep. Exactly. So uh, that's that's one thing. Cold calling is an, uh, another thing, right? Like, well, how much do you cold call? I don't cold call. Uh, I'm afraid to talk to people. Well, that's a limiting belief, right? Right. Because, and I'll tell you exactly why. When you're approaching that phone call as you want something from the person. Mm. And that's why you don't want to make that phone call. Yep. That makes sense. I challenge you to think about the next phone call you make as a cold call as you're helping that individual. Hmm. What can I mean, you do you for them instead of what can they do for you, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So. You, you don't know that the person that you're calling may be going through a divorce 
and he may need to get rid of the property. Right. And you may be his answer. True. Right. Yep. And at the, at the end of the day, if everything is hunky dory and there's nothing like he doesn't have a problem now, he may have a problem in the future. Yeah. And you are just reaching out to build the relationship. Mm -hmm. So when you make that phone call, the phone call is about building the relationship. The phone call is not about purchasing a property. Right. The phone call is about finding synergies between you and them. Mm -hmm. It's not about buying a property. Yep. I never make a phone call looking to buy a property. Yeah. Because law of numbers as well. I mean. Yes. Yes. Speaking of buying properties, so what? Now you're obviously active in multifamily and real estate. What um, what markets are you targeting currently? So my my market is uh, the southeast. So okay. I go down to the southeast, and uh, that's where I I like it because of the weather. I like it because of the population growth, yep. the job growth. Um, same, just all the same reasons everybody else likes. <laughs> yeah, this, exactly. the the southeast. Yep, uh, I'm based up in the northeast and. Uh, landlord tenant laws in a lot of these states appear are not favorable yeah. to us. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I just don't like the political climate, honestly. Of yeah. I've lived in Northeast my entire life. And the political climate's just not conductive to how I see my future going. Mm-hmm. I totally agree. I, I didn't tell you, but I was actually from uh, Western New York. So I started real estate oh. up there and you know, now I'm down in Florida. So I know exactly what you're talking about. So <laughs> I have properties I, up there. <laughs> I love, where, where are you in Florida, aren't you? Uh, Tampa. Okay. Mm-hmm. I yeah. love Florida. Yeah. Like, oh yeah. It's night and day. <laughs> yeah. It, it is absolutely night and day. <laughs> so no, before, um, before we jumped on here, you were telling me a, an awesome story about your son. You guys bought an eight unit property in Virginia beach. Uh, if you don't mind sharing that with the audience, I think it's it's an incredible story. Oh yeah, that goes back to that goes back to direct mail, <laughs> right? <laughs> so so I built a list. Uh, I brought a, uh, a property in Norfolk, and I built a list out, and I specifically targeted certain properties. Mm-hmm. So I I looked at the my overall list, and the way I picked up my properties was by assessed value. So properties that I could afford to buy okay. and then neighborhood. So no shooting zones. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And then because it's coastal, you should do this regardless of whether it's coastal or not, but specifically because it was coastal, I really paid a lot of attention to the flood zones. Mm-hmm. So I don't invest in flood zones, even though I'm investing. My property is a 50 second walk to the beach. Oh wow! And I'm not in a flood not zone. A flood zone. Hmm. You know, I have I have a, a ton of elevation around my property, so mm-hmm. I'm at okay. like a top of a hill. Okay. So as the water comes in off the bay, it comes up, it hits the top of my hill, and it goes down the other side. Oh, nice. So so I have elevation. I'm not in a flood zone, but those are the three criteria. So I have my list. It's affordable to me. Mm-hmm. It's not in a flood zone, and it's not in a crime zone. Yep. If one of those properties become available, I'm ready to buy it today. Mm-hmm. Now I go out and I do my direct mail, right? And as I'm doing my direct mail, it's postcards or letters. It's follow-up with phone calls. It's follow-up with text messages. It's building the rapport with the individuals. Mm-hmm. And it's building the rapport of I'm in your market. I'm local. I have I have local people that are down there that are the face of the company. So okay. we're local individuals. You're not just selling it to some New Yorker, mm-hmm. right? Right. So with that said, it took me a year to find the property. I find the property and we're going to the bank to wire the money. And I like including my kids in what I do. So I'm a very open book with them. These are the numbers. This is what we're doing. They, they know exactly what I'm doing. They actually get mad at me because what we do is listen to podcasts and audio books in the car instead of the radio. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. So, Mobile school. <laughs> yes. Yes. So he says to me, I'm driving down the town to the bank to wire money. And he says to me, dad, can I get in on this deal? And I'm like, well, do you have any cash? Because you're not like, 
you're not just getting in on a deal because you want to get in on the deal. Like, you gotta, <laughs> what are you bringing to the table? <laughs> and and you could see that he just he was all excited and it was like popping a balloon. He just got deflated. <laughs> and I do the um, the Ramsey envelope system with Mike. He he goes out and he works, and when he comes home on payday, he has to break up his paycheck into different envelopes mm-hmm. so that he can start learning that his money has to go into different baskets. And one of those envelopes is investments. So every day, uh, every week he'd come home, 10% would go into investments. And over the course of time, he saved up $500. Mm -hmm. So I said to him, well, what about your envelopes? And you could, like, he smiled. He was like, oh, I'm not not sure how much I have. All right, well, when we go home, we'll look at your envelopes. We'll see what you have. Mm -hmm. And I'll let you get in for whatever you want to get in up to the amount you have in your investment envelope. And he went home and he had $500 and he hand, I physically, he had to count it out and he had to physically hand me the money mm-hmm. because that's a visceral transaction there, right? Like it's yeah. creating emotion in him. Right. And that emotion's going to set with him. Mm-hmm. So he physically handed me the money and he now has a half of a half a percent, right? Yeah. <laughs> in, in the building. <laughs> so, so now we close in the building. We go down to Virginia, right? We're looking at the building with Hornet. He's like all happy. And there was a brick laying in the parking lot. <laughs> so the running joke is we picked up the brick and we handed it to him. He's like, all right, here's your piece of the, here's your piece of the building. Yeah. So, now, so now he has that brick upstairs on his shelf in his room. <laughs> and we built a story around it. And now yeah. he's like, how can I get into the next one? How can I get into the next one? And he's only 17, right? He's 17. Yeah. And uh, so I'll, I'll take this even the next step, Andrew. We, I have a duplex here locally. Mm-hmm. One of my tenants left in that duplex. And he wants to get into more. He wants to get into more. I'm like, all right, well, if you turn this unit in this duplex, then that unit will become yours. Hmm. But you have to do all the remodeling. You have to take the money out of your pocket and pay for the paint you're going to put on the wall. Yeah. So he was doing what everybody else does. He was going to work. He was going to school. He was going to work. And then he'd be going to the apartment. Mm -hmm. He'd get a couple of hours in on the apartment to to make that turn happen. Right. During that turn, he had to screen his tenant. Mm -hmm. He had to show the unit. He had to accept the deposit. He had to explain the lease. And I do that. I run that old school specifically so that he gets to know the money trail. Yeah. So he has to go down and interact with the tenant mm-hmm. and collect that money. Yep. So he collects the check and then he has to go to the bank and he has to deposit that check. And then I let him see the spreadsheet. Listen, this is we have to pay the bills on the property, right? We have to pay the mortgage. What's the mortgage? What's the taxes? What's the insurance? So he gets, he's in on that now and he gets to see it on a very small scale, but the exposure is so worth it. That's honestly the best education he can probably get, especially at that age. I mean, that's going to stick with him for a long time. So so I say to him, I'm going to give you, I offered him a hundred bucks, right? And one of my rules is, I don't care where you end up, but you always have to ask for more. So yeah. if you're going to buy something off a of Facebook marketplace and they they want $100 for it, you have to offer them something less than $100. Mm-hmm. So that you build that inoculation to not being embarrassed to ask the question. Right. Yep. Right? Yep. So he's like, well, how about 150 instead of 100 I'm like, whoa. <laughs> That's a, that's a little strong there. Right. We, so we went back and forth and we ended up agreeing on 125. Nice. All right. So he gets $125 a month. And I went a little easy on him. Like, honestly, like, yeah, because course. I wanted him to learn that process. I was super proud mm-hmm. when he asked mm-hmm. that I would have said yes right there, but I wanted him to, to go back and forth. Right. So fast forward a couple of months later, we were talking about something. I, I don't even know how it came up. And he said, you know, you, you don't know how hard it was for me to ask for $100. <laughs> well, yeah. And then go back and forth. Right. So that right there 
is priceless. Yeah, absolutely. Because he has that little bit of inoculation. Mm-hmm. And he, like, listen, if you don't ask. You're never going to get it. <laughs> you, right. You're never going to get it. And what, what's the worst that's going to happen? Right. I say, say no. no, it's a hundred yeah. and nothing. And you say, all right, I'll take a hundred. Right. <laughs> right. So you didn't, you didn't end up with anything less. Yeah. You don't lose by asking. That's for sure. So, right. It, it's not about, it's not about penny pinching. Right. Mm-hmm. It's just about, just about asking. Yeah. Like, that's it. Like, I'm going to throw that out there. If we can make it more then we make it more. If we can't, we can. Yeah. So it is. Like, as the numbers any. get bigger, you know, in negotiating yes. deals, it's going to be the same principle. It's know? the same exact principles mm-hmm. across the board, right? Yep. You analyze a, a deal, you agree to pay a million dollars for the property, two million dollars for the property. You go out and you do your inspections. Now all of a sudden the property, like it needs a new roof. Mm-hmm. Now you go back to the table and it's just a conversation. Right. It's, I'm not looking to get over. It's mm-hmm. just a conversation. Takes the fear. And that's out. how you approach it. Yes. yes. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And speaking of fear, you have a, a booklet on your on your website. Uh, maybe you could kind of tell everybody about that, how they can get it. And then also the annual planner uh, for mindset and goals. I think it's coming out pretty soon, right? Yeah. So so the annual plan is uh, at the designer right now. Mm-hmm. So that'll be coming out. Uh, it's scheduled to come out the late summer, early fall. So probably somewhere in the September range is what it's scheduled for. The fear booklet is a 20 page little booklet I wrote. It's on the website. You just go to the website, neilshep.com. It'll be on the bottom of the homepage. Just type in your email address and you can download it right there. It's, it's not a funnel for anything. Uh, it's not like you're going to type in your email address and then, and then I'm looking to sell you, upsell you or anything. (laughs) Right. It's pure, it's pure value. And it's just strategies and techniques that I've learned over 24 years of being in the police department and the fire department. Mm -hmm. Strategies and techniques that I've personally used and that I still use to this day Mm -hmm. that have helped me push through our fears. Uh, there's a study out there by who did the study? Leahy? Leahy out of Cornell did a study. And out of all of our fears, 85% of them never happen. Yeah. False 15, evidence appearing real, right? Yes. Mm-hmm. 15% of them, that the 15% that do, and you know you're in a negative thought process if you just said to yourself, well, what about the other 15%? <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Right. Become aware of that, yeah. interrupt that, and replace that. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you what to replace it with right now. So out of that 15%, 79% of those people said that the fear wasn't as bad as they thought it was going to be, hmm. or that they learned a valuable lesson out of it. Interesting. So when you do the math, what it really comes down to is we worry about all of this stuff, but we're only really worrying about 3%. is based on pessimistic thought processes. Mm -hmm. And the majority never comes true anyway. The majority never comes true. Um, And with these fears, we're talking more about on the anxiety side of things. It goes a little bit more into the book. There are actual true fears, right? Like Mm -hmm. when I was running around the corner chasing a man with a gun, there was a true fear there. Yeah. <laughs> when I was crawling down the hallway in the fire department of a of a structure that was on fire, there was true fear there. I still right. felt fear. Yeah. I'm the professional. I'm actually doing the job, but there's still fear there. Mm-hmm. It's about putting that fear aside, knowing it's there, using it as not a stop sign, but a yield sign. I use fear as a yield sign. When I feel that fear, mm-hmm. it's a yield sign. All right, what's going on here? Is it a true life-threatening fear or is it just anxiety, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. And when we push against that anxiety, when we push against that ceiling, we start chipping away at it. We chip away at it. We chip away at it. And then all of a sudden, boom, we break through it. Yeah. Think about a kid's party and a piñata. Ten kids will hit that piñata. It won't break open. The 11th kid comes up. He hits the piñata. Everything breaks out. Did the 11th kid really break open the piñata? Right. That's true. Mm-hmm. Right? Yep. Like, 
I guess technically he did, but it was all the work that the kids did before him that allowed him to do that. So as we push a little bit against our fears and a little bit against, as we lean into that, as we do those uncomfortable things, we become comfortable with it. And then there's always going to be something new there, Mm -hmm. but it's anxiety. Yep. Fears are like paper tigers. And Amelia Earhart said that, and she was absolutely right. Like it just treat them as paper tigers. Hmm. That's interesting. Yeah. That's true. I mean, yeah, not to mention the health effect it has on you, you know, fear and worry all the it's, time. <laughs> you know. The cortisol, yes. Yeah. The, the, uh, <laughs> but that cortisol dump still happens when we're living in that negative thought process, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. When I said 85% never happened and someone's mind went to, well, what about the 15%? There's a little bit of a cortisol drop in your system. Yep. And over time, that builds up and it literally decays your system. I've heard so that imagining the scenario is just as bad as actually living it, you know, and yes. for fear. Mm-hmm. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. There were studies, I can't quote the actual studies right now, but I've read um, stories about how uh, individuals would focus on, I'm just going to use tennis as the example. They would focus on how they swung the tennis racket and they would just go over that in their mind, visualizing the speed, the angle. They would visualize the ball hitting the racket and it, it going back over. And they actually improved their game just through that visualization. Hmm, I have seen, I have heard that. Yeah. Yep. So I, I I can't lead anybody to that, but it, people have done this. I've I've done it on a on a smaller basis, but the things that I visualized that have I really visualized the fire department's the, the biggest thing. I visualized going into the fire department, and I was there before I was even there. Yep. And I believe that because I had that mindset of I will, there was a, a line drawn in the sand. I will be a fireman. Mm-hmm. And because I did that, my mind had no other place to go. Yep. I didn't let anything else in. No, this is happening. It was absolute certainty. I think I know a similar study like that you were talking about. I think there was a like a control group that imagined playing some kind of instrument. I don't remember what it was, musical instrument, and a group that actually played it. And the group that imagined it and played it in their head over and over and over actually played better, you know, when they compared the yes. two. It's incredible, you know, to, yes. talk, to, to think about that. And you can, I mean, you can use this in anything. Mm-hmm. I do uh, martial arts and it's actually combative arts. So gun disarms, knife disarms, things along those lines. Mm. And when I was first learning those techniques, I would be driving in my car and I would be reviewing the steps of those techniques. And then when I went to class, I was already familiar with it. It's it's kind of it sounds a little bit hokey, but it's true. it's absolutely true. It's I was true, yeah. I was so much more comfortable walking onto that mat because I had visualized everything. Mm-hmm. And I was still clunky on the mat. It didn't make me a professional right away. Right. But it eased my anxiety mm-hmm. and I picked the the steps up much quicker. Yep. Well, Neil, what's the the best way for somebody to contact you here? And then we'll get into our, our five to thrive section. Uh, the five to thrive is going to be awesome. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. So uh, email Neil, N-E-I-L, at neilshep.com. So mm-hmm. N-E-I-L, S-C-H-O-E-P-P, double P, as in Peter Peter. Okay. Neilshep.com is the website. Neil at neilshep.com is the email. Uh, Facebook group, Neil Shep, is okay. the, the mindset Facebook group. I throw some YouTube videos up. YouTube is... I've Neil seen Shep. those. They're good, actually. Yeah. yeah, people should definitely watch those. Absolutely. So uh, the website is past podcast that I've done. Um, lots of different videos, a couple of articles. Uh, however, I can add value to people. Reach out to me if you have questions about anything I've said here. If you go to the website and you watch the videos, reach out to me, Neil at Neil Shep. When you actually type in the email, it comes to me. Mm-hmm. There's no assistant. It's it's you're talking to me. Oh. Um, I just I, I like that that personal interaction. Mm-hmm. I think yep. it's it's I don't like the corporate feel of things. Right. I, yep. I like that personal interaction. So 
Those yeah. are all the those are all the ways that if anybody has follow up questions, please reach out to me. I'm an open book. I'm here to add value and and to help you guys because when my mindset changed, Andrew, mm -hmm. I was I, it was like a rocket ship. I was like a completely different person. It was amazing. Yeah, yeah. I've gone along a similar journey. It's amazing what uh, you know. I, then just diving into like Jim Rohn. I love Jim Rohn. You know, I listen to him all yes. the time. Uh, so yeah, it's quite a transformation. But. So now, yeah, so our five to thrive. So <laughs> this is, you know, word association. So okay. I'll rattle off, you know, five words. And just give me back the first word or phrase that comes into your mind. Wow. The only thing is you cannot repeat your answer twice. It's a PG show, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I probably should have disclaimed that, right? <laughs> All right. So the first one is success. Success. So it, it's success to me is yeah, simply, so success to me is I achieve what I set out to achieve, whatever that may be. Mm -hmm. So me specifically, this right here, this podcast is success for me because I'm spreading the word that you have the power of choice, that you can lead your life and not have life lead you. Yep. So that's what success brings to me. Okay. Mindset. Mindset. <laughs> so so mindset's the key to everything that's the first thing that pops into my mind when you say mindset it's the key to everything it's the linchpin it's yep. the rocket fuel mm -hmm. or if you change your mindset and you change your paradigm you change the way you are viewing things you will automatically see the opportunities that are presented to you and when those opportunities are presented to you you'll have the wherewithal because you have the mindset to yep. take advantage of those opportunities. Totally agree. Goals. Goals. So goals are dreams that are written down. Hmm, that's a good one. I've never heard that. That's, that, that's when you say goals to me, that's how I look at goals. Yeah, I like I mean, that one. They're, they're all the things that you want to accomplish. Mm-hmm. But they're a dream, they're a, they're a pipe dream. And so you write them down and you gain clarity on them and you gain accountability on them. Yep, totally So agree. with clarity and accountability, you can, not that you can, you will succeed at your goals. Mm -hmm. Fear. Fear. Fear is paper tigers. Burn <laughs> your paper tigers. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> so... The the other thing about fear that I, I really want to mention that I think is really important is do you do you know what the difference between fear and excitement is? Mm -mm. Your thought process. Hmm. How you how you perceive that incident. When when you have fear and you have excitement, physiology uh, the physiology is the same within your body. Really? That's how you perceive it. Hmm. That's interesting. It's it's how you perceive it. Right. Yeah. It's, it's what you believe is going to come out of this hmm. that creates fear or creates excitement. Which all goes back to the thoughts, right? Like you said, goes back to your thought process. Yep. So, how am I perceiving this incident? Mm -hmm. Right. Hmm. I like that. That's Just think right. about the Walmart car accident. Right. Right. If you you're jump right. out of your car in conflict and you're yelling and screaming, your blood pressure's up, you're red in the face. But if you jump out of your car and it's a little old lady, right? And you're like, oh, are you okay? Don't worry about the car. We have insurance. It'll be all right. It's all in your perception. Mm -hmm. So fear and excitement are the same reaction. It's just your thought process that you go down one road or the other. Hmm. I like that one. Yeah. And last yeah. one, passive income. Uh, gold. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. So, so passive income is is why we're all here. Essentially, right. I, I, exactly. I would believe, right? Yep. So, passive income, to me, is freedom. Yep. To do what I want, when I want, how I want. Exactly. That's really what me personally, I'm after that freedom to mm -hmm. be able to do those things. Yeah. And that's what passive income affords me. 
Mm-hmm. You know, it's not always passive, right? Like we work right in, in the real estate we work, but the difference is when I was a fireman, I had to punch a, a clock. Yep, exactly. And I had to be there at a certain time and I had to ask somebody permission not to come to work. Mm-hmm. Yep. Where now, because I have that passive income, if I have a ball game to go to or a dance recital to go to or a barbecue to go to, for the most part, I have the power to move my schedule around Mm -hmm. and I can work where I want, when I want, how I want, and I can go to that barbecue. I can go to that wedding uh, that's out in the Midwest that I wouldn't normally be able to go to. Right. right? And you could still work, you know, from there, technically. And like, yes. And Mm -hmm. I could still work from there. Yeah. So that's what passive income is to me. Mm -hmm. It's freedom to be able to do what I want, when I want, how I want. And of course, within reason, like there's, right. there's, yeah. there's times, listen, in my duplex down in town, that's self-managed. So even though that's passive income, when he has a burst pipe on Easter morning and I'm right. about to go out to Easter dinner, yeah, who's not going to Easter dinner? Right. This guy, because I got to <laughs> go down and, and deal with the water leak. So things like that happen. Right. It's still passive. Yeah, exactly. So it's it's freedom. Passive income is freedom. Totally agree. Well, Neil, I really appreciate you taking the time to come on the show. It's been a pleasure having you here. I was very excited for this episode. So thank you. I'm really happy that we can get together, Andrew. It was great talking to you. I hope I added a ton of value to you guys. Absolutely. Guys, I'm 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 really serious. If if I can help you in any way, please reach out to me. Uh I'd say that to a thousand people all the time, and not too many people reach out. And it's sad. Yeah. It's the resources here, the proximity is here. Mm-hmm. Yep. Totally Use agree. It. Absolutely. Yeah. Nothing to lose. Right. So, all right. Cool. Well, thanks, Neil. Talk to you soon. I appreciate your time, sir. Take care of yourself.